Aggressive with the whiteboard. <laughs> Talking guys, I'm Uh, 
All right, I'm going to try to get started here. So uh, really, again, appreciate everybody's patience in bearing with us as we deal with some uh, frustrating network difficulties here uh, in the dungeon. So we're, we're, we're going to give this a go. We'll see, see how it works. Hopefully, uh, the results will be OK. <coughs> All right, so there's my eraser. That's over here. <laughs> I'm going to talk this morning. I'm going to talk this morning about hashes. And hashes uh, are another of these very fundamental data structures in Ruby. Uh, another thing that we're going to be using uh, just a ton, uh, all the time, constantly going to be seeing these things. And so similar to what we said about arrays yesterday, we want to start getting some kind of basic fundamental concepts and some, some basic comfort with them. Uh, and luckily, we already talked about arrays, so we can kind of use that knowledge to leverage a little bit into our understanding of hashes and maybe do a little bit of, uh, I think one thing that's kind of useful in looking at a hash is kind of comparing and contrasting how it's similar in how it's different from an array. Uh, so uh, the first thing to kind of point out here is a hash is another collection data structure. Just like we said with arrays, uh, hashes are one way, one other way that we have uh, for representing collections or groups of things. Uh, a hash differs from an array in that, uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, so the first thing is that a hash, um, the array that we, an array we set is for representing a sequential list, an ordered list, uh, and especially the keyword there being uh, a list of things. Those arrays kind of our go-to way of representing some kind of sequential list. A uh, hash is going to be our go-to way of representing colors to cooperate here. Uh, a hash is our way of representing some collection of named values. Named, or uh, we might also say of labeled values. And one uh, a kind of a programming term uh, that I like to use in this context you'll hear from time to time is that a hash is an example of, we would say, an associative an associative data structure. And again, what we mean by that is we'd say that a hash allows us to associate some name to some value. Uh, and in Ruby terminology, when we look at these ideas of associating some name with some value, uh, we're frequently going to call the name our key, and we'll call the value, unsurprisingly, a value. And so when we look at a hash, the kind of like fundamental job that it's doing is giving us some way to arbitrarily associate names or keys to arbitrary values. Uh, a great one thing that kind of sometimes helps me to understand or remember this: uh, some a lot of programming languages call their hashes a dictionary. In Python, for example, they'll call this a, a dictionary. Is kind of like a, a similar name that a lot of languages use for this data structure, and uh, it's kind of getting at the same idea. When I have um, when I have uh, a dictionary, 
I'm going to look up a key, a name, i.e. the word. I can look up pizza in the dictionary, and it will return to me, okay, here is the value. In the case of the actual like physical dictionary, you're going to get the definition. Here's the definition or the value that's associated with that name, uh, pizza. And uh, to kind of look at that analogy a little bit further, we could even say it's, it's kind of useful to think about. I, I, it would be hard for me, given the definition of pizza, to look up the name with which it is associated, right? The association doesn't go in the other direction. We would say none of that, right? It's, a, it's, it's, it's generally assumed to be a one-way kind of thing. So you'd say, Here, here's pizza, okay, here's the definition, right? Here's the name, here's your key, here's the value with which it's associated. Um, All right, and so that's kind of what a hash is about. Uh, and why, uh, why does this turn out to be so useful? Well, at the end of the day, uh, again, similar to how we kind of mentioned yesterday with arrays, that just a, a large, large percentage of our day-to-day -day programming work, day-to-day -day programming problems that we're going to encounter are going to work with like dealing with some list of things. Here's a list of numbers, here's a list of strings. Uh, with a hash, this, this use case of being able to say like, okay, here are, oops, hold on a second. Here are uh, some arbitrary associations between like some names and some values. It turns out to be a super, uh, super flexible tool, a super powerful tool, a tool that we'll use um, to to do to solve a lot of different problems uh, day to day. So that's the deal. Yeah, there will be a video. Uh, video should be recorded uh, off of the Hangout, so I'll share that out later. Hopefully, the video quality on that will come through okay. Uh, in the meantime, we're just going to do. Do the best that we can. Uh, so let's look at uh, hashes a little bit more specifically from Ruby's perspective uh, in terms of code. We'll see kind of how we might use them. And again, I'm actually going to fill in. I'm going to fill in a little chart here for us. Little hashes. Yeah, there we go. So uh, looking from the syntax perspective, yesterday we said we have arrays. Arrays, we see them a lot. We make them generally using the square bracket syntax. Uh, with a hash, our syntax is going to look, it's much harder to draw, but you're going to use the two double curly brace. That's kind of our ad hoc way of creating or defining a hash in Ruby in Ruby syntax uh, to kind of like capture a couple of these other things we said. It's an ordered, it's a list. Uh, hash is generally assumed to be unordered and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. Unordered and uh, we would say it's an association. <laughs> Associates between keys and values. Um, with an array, we uh, we talked about we could we could look at setting elements in the array by referring to their specific position. So I could say something like a square bracket zero equals something. Uh, and with a hash, we're actually going to be able to use that same syntax, uh, except instead of setting a numeric position, we said the hash doesn't, it's not ordered, it doesn't deal with this idea of like numeric ordered positions. We're going to be setting what our key, what our key is, and we're going to assign it some value. So a similar kind of syntax here that we're going to be using. Uh, so this is like, how do we syntax? This is our uh, stuff. This is our setting things. OK, cool. Uh, so let's take a look real quick at some Ruby stuff. OK, so I'm going to this. Yeah, new is cool. Um, we're going to do, I'm going to, we're going to kind of walk through, uh, similar to like what we looked at yesterday, we're going to walk through kind of just some of the common operations, common things that we'll do with a hash. Uh, one thing that's kind of interesting with a hash is that there tend to be slightly fewer, uh, there tend to just be slightly fewer tools in the toolbox. Uh, arrays 
we tend to have a whole large variety of different kind of operations and manipulations and things that we'll do with them. Uh, with hashes, we tend to not do that much except for the basic. We're gonna set keys, we're gonna assign values to keys, and we're gonna then come back later and we're gonna retrieve the value for a given key. So uh, hashes tend to be a little bit more basic in their usage patterns. That doesn't necessarily mean that they're any less powerful or any less flexible, it just means that we don't, we don't tend to kind of manipulate them in as many bizarre ways. So uh, I'm gonna dive into some, some combo arts and crafts and IRB time here. And as we go here, I'm gonna kind of try to put this stuff in the front of the camera as best as I can. We're gonna be using uh, my little black velvet uh, bag here. It's gonna be our hash. So this is gonna be the bucket, the dictionary, the place to hold our combinations of keys and values. And as we go, uh, I'm gonna use some little wooden beads that I got here to represent values that we'll be putting into the hash and some little labels or tags uh, to represent the idea of assigning a key or associating a key with those values. And the point that we really want to emphasize here as we go through is that with a hash, a value is only accessible in most cases through its key, right? The definition of pizza in the dictionary is only accessible by looking up pizza as the key, looking up pizza as the word that you're trying to find, right? And uh, that's kind of the thing, the, the sort of like main driving concept that we want to, I, I want to um, emphasize as we go through here. So I'm going to come to IRB real quick. And I'm going to, first of all, we said that that two double curly braces, this is our standard good old hash syntax. If I ask that for its class, tell me, hey, good job, you made a hash. It's similar to doing this for an array. It's like, good job, you made an array. Uh, and I'm going to go ahead and make one, and I'm going to assign it as data. I'm going to say data is an empty hash. So here's my data, my empty floppy hash bag here. Uh, and we said uh, of our operations, the first one that we'll kind of want to do here is assigning a new value. So this is kind of the hash equivalent of adding a new thing to an array. Uh, and as we go here, actually, I'm going to use... I'm going to use a little bit, uh, a little simple bead class to represent these beads that we're inserting into the hash. So I'm going to actually define before we dive in here a class called bead. Just has nothing in it really. So now I can instantiate bead, bead and new. Oops, can't type. Uh, so I'll be using these random little bead objects based off that class that we just defined to represent the things that we're putting into the hash. Uh, so, right, I'm going to create a bead. We'll start out with that. So bead equals bead.new. Remember, I just defined the class bead up here. So I can now instantiate it using new. And that gives me my bead. Here it is, lovely wooden bead. Now, again, the thing to kind of emphasize here is I have my hash data, and I want to put the bead into the hash. Uh, but I can't simply come along and say, hey, hash, can you just hold my bead, right? Because it's not the way a hash works. The entire point of the hash is to say, here's some value, some object, something, the bead, and I want to put it in my hash by associating that value with some key, some name, uh, or some label that will later on be used to assign that. And so what I would actually do here then is in my hash, I'm going to say data, the hash, square bracket of... I'll just use, we're going to use the letter T. I don't know why, because uh, I picked it. Data of T equals B, which says set the value at the key T to be a B, uh, and specifically to be which B, the one that I just defined here. Uh, we'll come back to what kind of things uh, do we use for keys in a second. Right now, I'm using a string as uh, a key. And so again, notice that's different from the examples when we had some array yesterday. And I would say some array with some number. I'm setting in the array only numeric indices, numeric positions. In this case, I can set uh, arbitrary freeform objects or values as the keys of the hash. Uh, so I assign that data of T and the B. And what that might look like on my object is I need, I have the hash, I have the B, I need my key to associate it. So I'm going to get my key and I'm going to actually write on it what my label is. So here my key is T and I'm going to somewhat awkwardly thread my label through my bead. If I can accomplish that. Ah. 
I'm attaching that key, attaching that label to that value, the bead. And there it is. And now that I have uh, these two together, and this is what we'll, we'll fr you'll frequently hear this term uh, in the context of hashes, a key value pair. Now that I've uh, successfully created some pairing between these two, the key T and the value, the bead, I can actually put the bead into the hash. And again, what's kind of the point of this whole like metaphor with the bag and the bead and stuff is that when we work with the hash, part of the intent is that I can only refer to things by the value, I'm oh, sorry, by the key. So key is out here, it's visible. I say, okay, the hash has the key of T in it. If I wanted to retrieve that, I can say, hey, hash, will you give me the thing that has key T? And it'll say, okay, well, here's T. Now let me pull that out. Okay, and here's the value that's attached to it. Whereas I can't really see ideally what's actually in here. I can't necessarily know what the values are. I can only associate them, access them by requesting the key that it's attached to. And then the hash is like, says that, okay? And so again, looking at that from code, I have, I now did the assignment by saying data of, hey data, you friendly hash, can you assign the value at the key of T to be this bead that I created the line before? Hash says no problem, I look at data, I can see that, okay, there's T, bead, it actually is showing us the value in this case. So when I said that you can't see the values, I was lying a little bit, but um, the important thing again to kind of keep in mind is we don't want to we want to kind of like pretend like the values are not really there or we'll pretend like they're not visible we want to always be accessing data of a hash by going through the key and to do that i would say data similar to how we looked at accessing array elements by their numeric index i would say data of t and it says hey good job here's your b there we go uh get that out of the way uh, cool. So data of T, look that up. So, hey hash, data, can you give me the thing for key T? Well, why, sure I can, here it is, T, okay. Here's your value, the B, you got it, right? And that's gonna be kind of our pattern and our, our dominant thing. And it's interesting, I mean, I think when you kind of first see this, it seems perhaps like somewhat primitive or, or rudimentary, but uh, you can really actually get a lot with that because the thing that this allows us to do is represent, because of the fact that the keys can be anything and the values can really be anything, this structure of some way to arbitrarily associate keys to values, it gives us a lot of flexibility. It gives us a way to represent a lot of different things, right? I need to associate a list of student names with their ages. I need to associate a list of instructor names with the module that they teach. I need to associate a list of uh, programming languages with the, I don't know, tools that are used to write, you know, whatever, like uh, associating arbitrary X to arbitrary Y uh, ends up being a thing that we just do a lot. We want to do that very frequently in our programs. Um, I'm going to pause now for a few seconds and see if, just, if there's any kind of basic questions so far. Um, cool. So, let's check the next one. Um, if he performs, he just I mean, you talk about only accessing it by the key, but what about when you call like hash dot values? Yeah. Uh, so Christine here asked. Uh, we talked about accessing things only by looking up the key. But then, what about when I call hash dot values? We'll look at that in a little bit. The thing about this is there are uh, there are kind of some ways to cheat it. Is the short answer like there are ways? You know, you, I'd say a general rule of thumb whenever someone says in, in programming like you can only do X, that almost always means like well you could do X most of the time, but there's actually some weird way to do the other thing, right? And so I say you can only access the values <laughs> by looking at their keys, and that's really kind of uh, it, it would be maybe more like accurate to say that that's kind of the proper usage of a hash is to access them in that way, but uh, there's always kind of weird things you can do, and so we'll see some examples later. There are things that we can do to take the hash, take our hash and turn it into an array or turn it into some other data structure, if that makes sense. Um, 
and so the thing becomes like just because you can doesn't always mean you should and so you know we can do that but we start to lose some of that kind of like intrinsic value of what the hash is all about you know and part of the thing part of the point of like kind of starting to think about hashes and arrays and how are they similar how are they different uh, and this is kind of kind of be a theme continued throughout the rest of the module is starting to think about what tools are both best suited for like what jobs right and so when I come up and I'm saying okay I have an arbitrary collection of data where the things are represented or identified by some flexible name or label that you know represents them I'm like okay hash right like associate between keys and values right or I say okay I've got some collection of elements that I need to put in a list and they have an order but they don't exactly have like a name or a label or I'm like okay array right um, and it just takes a while it takes a while to kind of like get a feel for that stuff and start to say okay well I've got I've got all these things in my toolbox here's the problem at hand which of these like tools is going to be the right thing to to do that um, so that was kind of a rambling tangent answer to that question but the answer is like yeah there's ways that you can like take the hash and kind of force it into a different structure right which is useful in some situations but it's not exactly using the hash in a way that kind of like it is what it's all about, I guess, as I might say. Yeah. Good question. Man. Yeah. Uh, so Sonia asked, what is b.new doing? I was kind of, uh, I could have, I don't know, perhaps the b example was maybe more confusing than it's worth, but I sort of felt like since I had, uh, yeah, I felt like since I had beads as my like things that I was using, I would just go ahead and make a simple Ruby class to represent them, so I define that here. And when I first typed b.new here, uh, the thing to remember, and we're gonna we're actually gonna talk about this some more this afternoon, is what is new when I say like something got new. What this is doing, right, is creating a new instance for us of the class something. So new is a method that you can actually only call on classes in Ruby. And so here I'd be creating a new instance of the something class, or in our case, a new instance of the B class. And what Ruby is giving us here is a little bit useless, but the thing to remember is uh, everything in Ruby returns a value of some sort. In the case of calling the new method on a class, what's the value that you get back? Well, it's some new bead object, right? And since I'm in IRB here, since I'm in IRB, when I type bead.new on a line and I just hit enter, the next value I'm gonna see is whatever that line, whatever this line generated or produced is gonna be the thing I'll see on the next line. So the short answer is, what is b.new? It produces a new bead object for us. Now, interestingly, in this case, I didn't really do anything with that bead. I said b.new. Ruby says, hey, here's your bead. Good job. But I kind of just dropped the bead on the floor. I didn't, I didn't like, assign it to a variable or call a method on it or do anything like that. Uh, an example of it might look like this. Assigned bead equals b.new. The b.new part hasn't changed, it sort of says, hey, give me a new instance of the bead class, but now I'm doing something more productive with that bead that it produced. In this case, I'm assigning it to a variable, and now I could use that to do stuff like, not a ton, the bead class is very basic, so there's not really a ton productive that I could do with it, but I could say dot class, hey, assigned bead, bead object that I just produced and assigned to this local variable, what is your class, and as we might Guess it's going to say, oh, B. I'm a B object because that was the class that you used to define. Yeah. Um, in the uh, yeah, in the command query stuff, mm -hmm. in the curls, there was a lot of like dot new. So is that kind of does initialize kind of go hand in hand with that? Because like yeah. you're initializing lots, you do dot new, and it just kind of like it's hitting reset kind of. Yeah, we're uh, we'll talk about that some more this afternoon. But uh, so Charlie's asking uh, that in the command query exercises, we see a lot of new and. I would, I would extrapolate that that's not just in those exercises, but actually just in Ruby in general. And we're going to talk about kind of how Ruby's, how Ruby's philosophy on programming looks and what, uh, what Ruby says to do. And, and one of the things it says to do is like do this a lot, make a lot of objects, and use objects to do your work for you. Uh, and we'll talk about this afternoon. What happens when I knew a thing? Well, it's going to create for me a new instance of assigned beat, or sorry, a new instance of that class beat. And additionally, it's actually going to automatically call a special method called initialize on that object. <laughs> and initialize is important because it kind of gives us some, some opportunities to do some basic introductory setup configuration of our objects when they come into being. In our case, 
again, class B is like about as simple a class as there can be. I didn't define initialize or any other methods, so B dot new. We'll try to call initialize, but there's nothing there, so it'll just ignore it, and then it gives me back the B. Uh, so, so we now when we come back and look at an example like this section, I said the first thing, B dot new, create a new bead instance. Bead equals assign that to a variable called bead. Then in the next line, associate that value bead in the hash with the key of the string t. And this is an interesting time to talk about uh, keys. What are the key? What kind of things do we tend to frequently use as keys? Um, and the sort of short first answer is technically anything, any Ruby object. Any Ruby object can be the key of a hash. Uh, so there are certain scenarios where you'll use that, uh, use that to your advantage, use that productively. But I would say in, a, in, in, in common practice, we tend to more frequently use strings or symbols. And we haven't really probably talked about symbols very much. But I would say that uh, in, in, in common practice, we're, we're going to tend to see strings and symbols most frequently as keys in our hashes. And if we kind of think back to these ideas that we talked about, it makes some sense because we said the point of the key is to give us some name or some label or some tag for that value that we're inserting into the hash. So it makes some sense, I'd say, that like a string, we just give it a string, a textual label, a textual name of some sort, right? Um, and you know that comes back to, in our case, the key that we used up here was data of t, the string t is serving as my key or my label there. Uh, we haven't talked a ton about symbols yet, but what would it look like with a symbol? Well, I can say uh, a symbol is created by typing a colon in Ruby and then typing some letters. And a symbol is in some ways similar to a string. Uh, we tend to use symbols uh, actually frequently as keys and hashes because they have this kind of uh, inherent implication of representing an arbitrary label or an arbitrary identifier of some kind. Uh, and so you'll see that a lot as well. You'll see something like data of key equals value. You'll see something like this a lot. Uh, Sonia, I have kind of moved on, but let me know if that answered your question or not. Uh, or if you have more questions, happy to talk about that. Uh, I'm going to go on now. Let's do another one because uh, I'd like to put a few more things. So far, I got a hash that has one key and presumably one one value inside of there that's associated with it. Uh, I'm going to get another bead. So I'd like to put my second bead here, new bead, into the hash. So I'm going to go through the same process. I'm going to get some label, some value, or sorry, some key uh, to associate it with. I'll go with the key of u. So my key is going to be u, my value is going to be this lovely bead here, and I'm going to associate the key with the value by this excellent metaphor of threading it through and attaching the tag. You guys didn't know when y'all signed up, you would be doing so much arts and crafts. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble with my tag here. There we go. All right, got it done. So now I attach it, attach the key of u to the value our bead. And remember, this is we, we might say here we're creating a key and value pair. I have a pair of these two things that go together. Uh, that gives me the ability to put the value, to put the pair into the hash. So now I have two values in there, t and a u, piled in, et cetera, et cetera. And again, in Ruby, I might have a data of u equals another bead, bead dot new. So I'm going to create a new bead associated with the value u in the hash. Uh, in this case, I, in the other case, I, I took the kind of preliminary step of uh, assigning bead as a local variable that referred to the new bead in the, that I created. In this case, I just stuck it straight into the hash uh, right off the bat. Uh, either one is fine. Uh, this kind of just makes it a little bit more step-by-step step of what's going on, but really the same thing is kind of happening here. We're creating a new bead 
and associating it with the key of you in the hash there. All right. Let me see what other operations we got here. Let's get in here. Oh, that's good. That's the next one. Uh, let's put in a couple more here. I'm going to put in a third. Uh, oh, where's my things? Tu. Let's put in a, another bead with the value of another bead. I'm going to put the value of v, as in I don't know, vociferous. So I got my key of V, my value of the bead, tie them together to make my key value pair. Key value pair, oops, that's upside down. The key of V associated with the value of that bead and I can now again also put V into or sorry, put that value into the hash, and if I need to look it up, I will have to come along and say, hey, hey, hash, can you give me the thing that's associated with the key of V? It'll pull it out. Here's your value. Here's your B. Good job. Um, and that's cool because now I have a few things in my hash, and the point, uh, I want to kind of stop for a second and pause on this point, which we said that a hash, by contrast to an array, is unordered. And it's an interesting thing to point out because it's, it's, it's a thing that is kind of true. Uh, it's true in concept, and I would say it's kind of an idea that's somewhat essential to the conceptual nature of a hash that is simply these arbitrary associations between things and other things. Um, you know, in practice, we can argue that, okay, well, I picked this thing up. There obviously, there obviously has to be an order, right? Here I have V and then T and then U. Like, there's, there's going to be an order of some sort. Um, but one thing that's interesting is with a hash, I have it here and I set it down and I pick it up again. It's somewhat unlikely that I end up, because of the way that they're all just piled in there together, it's somewhat unlikely, I don't know what order I had before, that I end up getting them back out in the same order. Uh, I don't know, I got a VUT now or whatever. Uh, and so, you know, in terms of kind of the actual concrete implementation of how a hash works in Ruby, well, you know, at the end of the day, there is going to be an order under the hood. Uh, just because that's kind of the way that the world works, but it might be more accurate to say that with a hash, we generally want to uh, not consider or not think about or especially not rely on the order. Because again, when I have TUV, if I'm coming in here to look for the key of U, it actually doesn't really matter to me if there's five other keys or a thousand other keys or no other keys. I'm coming to go straight to the one that I want and pull it out, right? Um, and that's kind of, again, one of these kind of fundamental points to drive home about a hash is that we're thinking about simply the one-to-one -one association from T, the key of T, to the value of this bead. Oh, God, I just dropped, dropped beads and keys and values everywhere. Uh, the value of that bead that it's associated with. Right? And hopefully that discussion uh, fulfills our directive here to contemplate the egalitarian nature of a hash as an unordered society. Um, every key every key, and every value are considered uh, equal in the hierarchy of a hash. Uh, you simply go one to one. Uh, let's see, do we have any questions coming up here? Uh, let's go on and look at another uh, important principle of a hash. We said that we're associating one key to one value. And one of kind of the necessary outcomes of that is that I have here bead, the one that I created before. I'm going to now create a second bead, bead2 equals bead.new. And I'm going to associate that value in the hash with the key of t. So data of t equals bead2. And if I check these ones, I can check now. Again, to access that value, I'll say what's in data of t. Okay, it's a bead. Well, which bead is it? Is that bead equivalent to, is that bead one? Just bead? No, it's not. Is it bead two? Yes, it is. And uh, the, the kind of point that we're trying to drive home here is that keys in a hash are assumed to be unique. You can only have one copy of a given key, so I can only have one value associated with the key of T, 
if I come along to my hash and try to assign a uh, value into the hash with a key that already exists, uh, that key will end up getting overridden with the new value. And so if we think about that from the perspective of our hash, so far I've been inserting values just arbitrarily by simply saying, okay, hey, put this in. Uh, but I might need to add a second kind of, in my head, I might need to add a second step here, which says that I have a bead, this lovely bead here, and I would like to assign it in my hash to the value t. So I have to first ask myself, well, ask myself, does t exist in the hash? Does the key of t already appear in there? And in this case, it turns out it does. So I will have to actually remove the old value of t See you later, bead one, original bead that was here. You have done your duty. Now new bead, bead two. You will become the new value associated with the key of T. It's your time to shine, bead two. Except that I can't thread the string through the hole in the bead. Oh my god. Arts and crafts is uh, sometimes challenging, guys. There we go. <laughs> Don't worry, guys. The internet hasn't broken, or maybe it has, but I'm just fiddling with my hash bag here. Uh, okay, so now I've reassociated that original key of T with their new bead here, and I can put it back in the hash. And uh, we would frequently say that we're there. Uh, we might say that we're. I'm running out of space here, but let's say that keys are unique. And we might say that if we reuse a key, we would overwrite the existing value. Uh, and so the hash has now forgotten about that original bead, uh, the first bead one that was there. Okay. All right. Uh, I think let's take a let's take a little Pomodoro here. Let's take a five minute break and come back at ten at eleven seventeen. Uh, and we'll talk at that point about a few things uh, that we can do that sort of change or manipulate the structure of the hash. So maybe if I don't think I think first um maybe was a like uh so I think it's like a okay so really like it's a good thing that I know to do that with uh maybe if I can kind of like um like constants uh like it's a bit very 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 similar. I don't think it's a it's a two million dollars like um is that maybe it is more um, it's like you know, it's like um, you know, and so therefore, like, they have like more. Their framework is amazing. And really um, I think that's more what they would like to do. Um, I can I can I I
Sorry, Luigi, you just saw your message. I put the IRB up now. It's almost like one letter or one number. I'm actually friends with one of the Red Bull friends. And they had like this event. Like walk around that the whole day. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, I don't know if you can get your not like not. So I was like, oh, this is I don't know. I'm just going to do the first two questions. I'm raising up the group. No, I wish I did. But I did not. They make some rest. Yeah. I would love to do a great girl. I would love to do a great girl. In Vegas, we had an event where like you get to like sit like, in like a car and like they go around the track. So if I paid, I could have driven, but like I didn't have three hundred dollars for ten minutes. And we were even going that fast, and it's just like you're sitting there, and you're like, yeah, I would not want to be around like, like other moving cars. It's like I know, right? Or I just get that away. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and now, uh, right, going, going, going high bandwidth. Oh, now it's um, so. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's kind of confusing. <laughs> um, so these went from like 240p to 4k. Yeah, I know. Okay, so I didn't start like two games, you know, it's funny when you figure it out, like it sucks, like it sucks before Yeah. I think this one's Yeah, yeah. I mean, personally, from my experience, I think that was the hardest um, so because it's like, at least for me, like, I was still just like, not grasping that whole like, perceptual and then it's like when I found like, no, all right, yeah, like, yeah. And then from there, you kind of like, you kind of feel like a milestone, so then you're like, now I'm like, here's another. And our Absolutely. Yeah, I mean it's only one. We got to like week three and I was like, mm, I think I'm gonna need to win this. And I was like, so you don't want to yeah, and you work kind of like so cool. so, I tried five. So it was like week three. I was like, I wouldn't even say week like three. Week three. Yeah, I'm going to need to like really have like some massive breakthrough or I'm going to have to read. So I mean, I kept trying because it's like, who knows what you can do. And it all did start kind of picking up and going faster, but it wasn't enough. But now it's like, I'm just going to have to come to the So, but you say, no, first couple weeks, like, yeah. Um, it's hard, like, you know, going back to like almost like that first day of like, you know, Mary Jess, like, man, that was just. Oh, right. All right, let's see what we're doing. 
start up we're gonna start we'll start back up again uh, all right so uh, we looked at kind of the basics here uh, we looked at setting keys assigning keys to values in the hash uh, putting those in there we looked at retrieving a value given the key so we was telling the hash hey hash will you give me the value that's associated with the key of T or U or V or whatever uh, and God, that video looks so much better now Amazing. Uh, the uh, there's a few other things that we can do with a hash uh, that have to do with taking the hash and turning it into another data structure of some sort, right? And so we looked at um, again another example that we've seen that is maybe kind of relevant here. We looked at taking a string and splitting the string, which turned our string that we started with into a new structure, actually an array of other strings, right? Uh, sometimes in a hash, it would be useful to us to know. Hey, Hash, what are all of the keys that you currently contain? And uh, we can do that, actually, with a method that is unsurprisingly called, sorry, I'm just leaving my sweet ping times up here so everybody can uh, feast on our new, our newly improved network performance. Uh, we can ask the Hash, hey, Hash, what are your keys? And, oh, mine only has, I'll put one more in there so that the Hash that I have there matches the bag. Uh, data that keys. I can ask it. It'll say, "Okay, here's an array of the keys." And this kind of revisits the point I mentioned that you know I say the hash is unordered, like asterisk, right? I mean, technically, there's always an order for something, but uh, the order is not significant here. And especially with a larger hash, you might find that the order uh, of keys that come out changes as you put new things into the hash. Uh, but in this case, this just gives us an array of the keys that are there. So that would be as if I took my velvet bag, I said, hey, velvet bag, what are the keys? It would then pull all these keys out and put them into an array similar to the one that we looked at on the board yesterday. I'll spare you all the process of watching me stick more cups onto the board and uh, array those out, but you can, you can imagine. Uh, and remember, the kind of giveaway there, whenever you see square brackets, your brain says array. Uh, and if I wanted to, I could also ask that for its class. Hey, Hey, keys thing, what is your class? Similar to that, I can actually ask the hash for its value. Sometimes I want to know what are all of the values, not just one specific value, but give me all of them in a big old pile, data.values. And square bracket tells me another array. That's cool. And what I have here is an array of three bead objects, which are obviously the values that are in there. So value says, pull everything out of the hash, Discard the keys and simply give me the give me the values there that go along with them. Um, and the same point holds here. They will come out in an order. We don't necessarily want to like rely on or assume or trust that order in any way. Um, last one here. We sometimes will count data that count. Tell me how many key value pairs are in the hash. And keep in mind that this says. Uh, it doesn't say six here, right? We could con it's conceivable we might expect it to say six because you have the three keys and the three values. Data.count is asking me how many pairs are in the hash. And again, it kind of comes back to this idea that you want to think of your hash as, well, here's the keys. And inside of here, they somehow associate to some collection of values, some arbitrary things. But the identifiers or my kind of point of access or way of getting into the hash comes out from the uh, from the keys themselves, right? So when I ask the hash for its count, what is really going to count for me there are effectively the keys or, or what are the pairs? Um, so that's a good one. All right, I got one more that is a little bit bizarre. We're going to look at it in a second. Uh, before we go on to this last one, are there any questions about uh, any questions about hashes or Stuff that we kind of looked at so far. Is there like a little 
Uh, when you call the values, it might come back in a different form for your time. Call it, you said. Yeah, exactly. yeah so um, Megan. Megan says, uh, when I call the values method, it might come back in a different order. Uh, and the answer is yes, but uh, it's sometimes hard to reproduce. So let's see. If I ask this for its values, it's going to be, a, oh, let's try keys, because keys is, we can actually see what they are. So these are going to be the same. I think that what we're going to see is these are going to show up at the end. Yeah. Uh, for uh, for most hashes, you're going to see that they actually come out in the order that they go in. Ruby has kind of done a, a somewhat uh, controversial uh, trick in the last couple of versions of Ruby, which is that they made hashes actually have an order underneath the hood uh, for reasons that you can go like read up on if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Um, but you know, it's an example of a thing that you'll see kind of in a lot of languages. You might you might run this and it like, comes back differently, or more likely, I, I would run this and it would come back in this order. But then if I added more keys, they might get like shuffled around as the hash kind of moves things around internally to make room for stuff. Um, but I, I think maybe the the most important point is to think about like, well, I want to I don't want to really think of a hash as an ordered thing because that ultimately. Uh, it, you know, if I think about it in that way, it tends to lead me down a path of working with the hash in the way that it's kind of not suited for, right? If I have a thing that, if I need to have a thing that's ordered, the thing that's suited for that, again, is the array. If I need to have a thing that associates arbitrary names to arbitrary values, then I'm thinking hash, right? Um, so, yeah. So you can I kind of wish, I wish that they would actually just come, it would make teaching a bit easier if they would just come out random every time. So you'd be like, Trust me, they're you'd be like they're unordered. Let me show you, and they'd be like, okay, I believe you. But now it's like they're unordered, and you're like, no, you're full of shit. Like they are ordered. Look at them. Um, but it's yeah, more accurate to maybe say like, okay, just don't worry about the order. Just pay no attention to the, the man behind the curtain. Uh, so that's a good question. Josh Cohen is gasping in 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 amazement at our amazing latency times here. <laughs> Um, shit, I had another thing I was going to say. Oh, oh yeah. Um, another thing that is interesting about hashes is um, it's beyond the scope of what we're trying to talk about today, but kind of coming back to this idea of restricting ourselves to only accessing by looking up a key and retrieving the value. Internally, there are some really interesting um, performance characteristics of hashes that make doing this super efficient but make iterating through the thing like not especially efficient and so uh, it doesn't particularly matter for anything that we're looking at now or even probably in all of module one but down the road we'll maybe find scenarios where um, we get some interesting kind of like performance or speed benefits by restricting ourselves to accessing or working with the hashes in this way uh, in this way that's kind of what's intended there so it's kind of some neat stuff uh, right uh, so looks like don't see any more questions right now. I'm going to go on to cover kind of our last little thing. Um, so we talked about, um, sorry, I'm just flashing the board on and off for some reason. Um, talking about hashes and arrays, they have some similarities, some differences. The ultimate fundamental similarity that uh, both of them share is that these both uh, are data structures that we use to represent collections of things, groupings or um, aggregations of things. And you all worked on with Mike uh, some yesterday and some today. Some examples of uh, common operations that we do with collections is uh, involved like iterating through the collection or taking my array and like running through all the elements and doing something for every one. Uh, and a hash, uh, it turns out we can also enumerate it, or we might say that the hash is also, it's enumerable. It can be enumerated, oops, uh, just like an array can. And uh, we'll look at some examples of that. The thing with enumerating a hash is that uh, it has an interesting property that we'll see is a little bit different than how we work with an array. So I'm going to start out actually with, uh, let's see, clear that. I'm going to start out with an array example here. So I'm going to say array is, oops, array is the numbers one, two, three, four, and five. And we've seen examples now. If I want to, for example, go through those and print them out, I'll use each. And I'll pass to each a block. And within that block, I'm going to assign 
a lo block local variable number. Remember, what's inside of the field goes field goal pipe things uh, becomes what we call a block local variable, a variable that's accessible only within the scope of the block that it's attached to. And I can put number is number. Uh, oh shit! I said each by each. My bad. My bad. Just seeing if y'all are paying. Array. Array dot each. Do number. Puts number is number, and and then we'll see. Number is one. Number is two. Number is three. Number is four. So again, this allows us to address the elements of the array one at a time at a time. Uh, if I look at my hash data, I have now uh, looks like five pairs. I can check that again with counting. Five pairs of things in the hash, and I can iterate these as well. I can enumerate through them just like I did with the array. The thing to keep in mind when we're iterating with a hash is that in the array, I just have things. I just have like some numbers or some strings or some whatever, just arbitrary stuff is in the array, and so I'll walk through those and see one thing at a time. In a hash, I don't just have arbitrary individual things. What I have is actually pairs of the two things together. I have the pair of the key, key, and the value with which is associated. And when I'm enumerating or iterating through a hash, I'm going to actually be addressing those pairs together one at a time. And the short answer, uh, the short version of what that means is that when I want to iterate the hash, I have my hash data. I'll say each. I'm going to iterate through it. I'll say do to give it the block. And I'm going to now define my block local variables that are going to be used to refer to the elements in the hash one different element for each iteration. This time, I'm going to actually have two of them because the hash has, as we said, a pair of a key and a value. Rather than just having one number when I iterate through the array, uh, when I iterate through the hash, I actually have both. I have both the key and the value so that I can see uh, which one goes with which as I iterate through. And so I can do something like this. Key is key and value is Value. And as we do this, we'll see that for each one, the key is T, the key is U, the key is V, the key is G, the key is Y, and the value is some beads. Again, kind of hard for us with this janky bead implementation that I have here to tell what kind of bead it is, but that's fine. Uh, and kind of, again, the big point to make here is that uh, iterating a hash works very similarly to iterating through an array, uh, but uh, with the exception that rather than just getting the single thing, the single element that appears in that position of your array, you're getting both elements, the pair of the key and the value as you go through. Um, and, uh, you know, again, uh, this is a thing, this is a tool that you'll use from time to time that can be useful in certain situations. We're kind of, when we do this, we're kind of straying from that essential nature of what a hash is about, right? Because we said that Going from here to here is very smooth and efficient and natural. Saying, like, give me the whole pile of everything. Uh, we're effectively kind of taking the hash, turning it into an array of these pairs, and then like running through them one at a time. Uh, so, you know, can be useful for certain things, can be useful in certain situations, but maybe not necessarily the most common way that we tend to work with a hash or most common operation that we'll see. Um, mm -hmm. um, Let's see, if you look back at the lesson plan that uh, I linked earlier, where it says introducing hashes, you'll see here kind of some takeaways, like super quick five bullet point summary. Um, again, I think one thing to emphasize here, and you'll kind of see more examples of this as you go on into more of the exercises and projects, is that uh, from some perspective, I think hashes tend to have slightly fewer operations, fewer common things or or methods or common things that we'll do with them. Uh, they are, I think, a tool that's a great example of something that's like conceptually very simple and a little bit minimal, but because of that, super flexible and super powerful and useful, right? So, uh, you know, you'll you'll end up using them in a lot of a lot of your day to day work. Um, so let's see. Yeah, Aaron says. Aaron says, do you have to use two block variables? Um, the answer is yes, and the reason is something that we don't necessarily have to time to go into in a great depth. But 
Uh, if I leave only one block variable, say I put only key here, what I'm going to get there is not actually the key, but the pair. I'm going to get here the pair as a two element array. So Ruby kind of forces us to take the whole, like the combo, both of them, whether I want to or not. And so we can kind of look at this with an example. If I each, data that each do a pair, only one block variable, we'll see that the pair that I get is actually an array of the first element being the key, the second element being the value, right? So I now have an array of u and then the value v, an array of the key v and the value v. Uh, so you can't do that, but it doesn't just give you the key, it gives you the pair. And so if you wanted only the key, you could do something like pair.first. Or maybe maybe better and more readable is I ignore that and I just say e value and puts key and just ignore the value right um, and I think that's what uh, what Karen what Carrie Carrie mentioned here yeah the same thing you you can uh, if you only need the key you can take it as a variable and just ignore the value every now and then you'll you'll sometimes maybe see this kind of convention sometimes people when they are doing that, saying I'm, I'm like taking two arguments to my block, but one of them I'm not using, or one of them doesn't matter. Sometimes people will use an underscore to represent that. Oops. Sorry, I screwed up. Oh yeah. So I say something like puts key, and so what have I done here? I've just as the local variable name for that element, I've just called it underscore instead of calling it value. And sometimes this is a convention to represent kind of like okay, I'm taking this thing, but I don't actually like care about it or need it. I'm just kind of ignoring it. Uh, and again, there's nothing like Ruby doesn't say anything about like, oh, thy, thou shalt use underscores to represent your unused things, just like a community readability convention that some people will use. Uh, cool. Any questions? Any other questions? Just to clarify, a key can have multiple values, but a value can't have multiple keys, right? Uh, it's the other way around. Christine says a key can have multiple values, but a value can have only one key. Uh, you could actually have multiple keys assigned to the same value conceivably, but you could every given key can only ever have one value that's associated with it. Let's look at an example. I'm going to have new data is a new hash. Uh, sorry, new data is a new hash. I will make. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to call this, okay, string one is pizza, string two is calzone, and I'm going to assign here new data, assign the value k to be pizza, that works. I could also, if I wanted to, assign another key, a second key, new data of l is also be pizza. Uh, I can assign those to be the same one. I don't know why I bothered to assign these here since I just typed it out. Uh, I can then say data of h i i whatever. I can have all of these three keys pointing at the same value, uh, but for any given key, I can't also assign k to also be calzone. So if I try this, now if I look at new data. These ones both now point to pizza, but this one is now pointing to calzone. So again, what we would say here is this assignment overwrites uh, or overrules the value uh, that had previously been assigned to K. And now instead of pointing at pizza, which is what it was before, it's going to point at calzone. Uh, so that's why we would say like you can have only one, each key can only associate with one single value, but you might have multiple keys that point to the same value. Christina's still skeptical. I thought we've assigned multiple values to the same key. Uh, yeah, that might be right. Maybe we're just kind of like talking about it different ways. So you could also assign she's to K2. So K would then be calzone she's. No, right, because when I do this, calzone, they don't, they don't like add in some way. Calzone gets lost, right? 
yeah. is the point to make here, right? Yeah. For like a way around that, could you just make the value an array with the keys right. that calzone? So then, yeah, so the next question is like, well, what if I need to have K that's associated with multiple things, right? And now you have to think about how do I, how do I use some other data structure to represent that, right? Maybe if I needed to be, maybe I do cheese comma calzone, you know, or maybe I do an array of cheese calzone, et cetera, you know. So if I need that kind of behavior where the value, I'm sorry, the key is actually representing multiple things, then what I generally will need to do is figure out some way to put those multiple things into a collection of some sort. And then that one collection becomes the value that's associated with it, right? And it's kind of like an interesting point about collections in general. Part of what makes collections in programming languages a little bit hard to work with at first is that they have this kind of bizarre duality that it, it somehow represents multiple things, but it is itself only one thing. You know, the array is That array itself is only one thing. It happens to contain or represent or collect multiple things inside of it, right? But it is itself still a single thing. So this could be, here's an, an interesting example, new data of array equals array. I'm gonna look at that. K is just cheese, L is pizza, I is pizza, but then the key of array is associated with this array, right? And so. I don't want to go like too deep into this and like melt our brains just yet, but uh, you know it's worth mentioning that the keys and values of a hash again can be any arbitrary Ruby object. I can have a hash inside of a hash. New data of hash equals another hash. Uh, we haven't looked at this syntax, but uh, and now I'm going to look at new data. I have the key of hash associated with the value of, oh my god, it's like another hash, what the hell is even happening? Uh, and we haven't, uh, this may be the first time we've kind of looked at this syntax. Um, sometimes we get tired of having to say like, my empty hash is an empty hash and then like set the things one at a time. Ruby allows us to write uh, a hash kind of in line with predefined keys and values by assigning the keys and then using People generally call this the hash rocket or the rocket. Use the rocket to point to the value. So that's going to give me a, a, a new hash that has those pairs already defined inside of it. Um, so a little bit of a tangent there, but the point is, yeah, you can put you can put all kind of crazy stuff in a hash. What if you're making hash and you realize? halfway through that you totally messed up and you should be switching the values and keys, like it makes more sense to go one way. Is there like a quick way to switch that? Uh, I think that there is a inverse, invert? Yeah, okay. Okay, cool. This is an interesting operation. Yeah, there's a bunch of things. And again, the place to look here, Ruby 222 hash. You dig around in here, you'll find all manner of bizarre operations and cool things you can do. But uh, hash dot invert says, "Give me a new hash where what had previously been the keys is now the values and vice versa." So now we have now it gets even weirder because now that hash that I made a rocket b is actually the key, and the value that is it represents is the string of hash. And you might ask yourself, like, why would I do that? And I would say, like, probably it doesn't make a ton of sense. Uh, you know, because again, the point of the hash is to kind of give nice, clean, readable, useful semantic labels to stuff generally. And I would say like this is not the most semantically clear or elucidating label that we could come up with, but it is possible. Like Ruby will support it. Right? Yeah, I was just thinking more of like you just kind of like mess up and you're like, oh, right, right. It's perhaps things. a more common scenario. You know, um, thing to remember there that's interesting. What do I have in my new data? This and this, what do they share? The same value. So then when I invert it, that would actually produce an overlap between multiple keys. And so if I have new, if an interesting example is if I look at new data, I have five pairs. If I invert that, I only have four pairs because the second pizza got lost. And it looks like if we look at it now, it looks like the L is the one that got lost and the I is the one that won out. So 
Um, just the point to make is kind of sometimes you have to be careful when you're thinking about like doing weird stuff with hashes because because of this fact that it enforces uniqueness of the keys. Uh, sometimes it can do kind of weird things that maybe you didn't really anticipate or like didn't mean for to happen, you know? I guess it's a good example of order doesn't matter either. It's just like FBI. Yeah, it looks like in this case it took the last one, right? But you would want to be careful with that because it might not necessarily, you know, it might not necessarily right. always be that you put I in after L, so you might get weird things. What'd you have? You have one? Well, you kind of answered it, but essentially I was going to say, like, I mean, in the rare case, like, say, pizza, this is what really close is if they're like objects. It wouldn't overwrite because they would be different because they'd have a separate object ID. Like if you were to invert it, like say they're both named pizza with the same variable, or would it just recognize the variable? Yeah, that's a good different. question. It uses the, the, the short answer, which is a little bit. This is a little bit alive, but it's going to go based on like that. Right. Okay. And so even though this instance of the string pizza is not exactly really the same as this instance of the string pizza because they're equivalent. Okay. Which is different, and this gets into a very interesting topic in programming and computer science where we talk about. What's the difference between identity versus equality? These two strings might not necessarily be identical because they could be different objects in memory in the virtual machine and like da 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 da, but they can still be equivalent because they represent the same value, right? Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Yeah. And so, in short, when it when a hash is considering like are these keys the same or not, it's going to consider equality rather than identity. Because once um, again, that's how you put it in there with that tag or variable or whatever. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Exactly. So Jason says, "What would the hash written in line be called since we didn't assign it a name beforehand?" That's an interesting question. So I said, "Pizza equals yummy." And uh, the short answer is, it wouldn't really be called anything. It just is a hash, right? And so, uh, you know, especially when we're playing around in IRB, we frequently are assigning things to variables so that we can kind of poke around and prod them and do stuff. Um, but don't you know? Don't forget that there's nothing inherent in the language that somehow enforces that every value has a um, name of any sort, right? And so here, what is? How does Ruby read this? Ruby reads this as saying to the interpreter, "Hey, Ruby, will you create for me a hash? And in that hash, associate the key of pizza with the value of yummy." Ruby says, "Okay, here's your hash." And I said, "Okay, oh, I dropped the hash. It's on. It like got lost, right? It's toast." Um, because uh, assigning a variable to a thing is kind of our way of, of like grabbing hold of a thing, grabbing hold of something, especially within IRB or that kind of a context. Uh, and so this this hash turns out to have probably had a very short lifetime, where Ruby created it, it printed it to the screen because that's what IRB does; it always prints the results to the screen, and then it disappeared. I wouldn't really have a way to access that at this point. Where's the empty hash? The name. Uh, let's look at that. I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, maybe what you're talking about is like now if I did this. Now that hash Ruby does the same thing. Hey, create a new hash. Assign the value pizza. I uh, sorry. Assign the key pizza to the value yummy. That's done. And also store that as the name uh, pizza hash. And it's like, okay, done. Uh, and so now I can continue to refer to that. Uh, perhaps one thing that's worth emphasizing here is that you have to be a little careful not to get mixed up between when we're assigning Ruby objects to variables and when we're assigning values to keys inside of a hash. Uh, it's actually interesting that these two have some very similar behaviors. If you think about it, at the end of the day, a local variable is simply a way of arbitrary Local variable is simply a way of arbitrarily associating some name, the variable name, to some value, the object to which you assigned it. Uh, under the hood, Ruby actually is using something like a hash to store all of your local variables in any given time. Uh, and so there's some kind of some deep conceptual resonance, perhaps, that goes on there between like hashes and variables and stuff like that. But uh, from our perspective as a user, we want to make sure that we kind of keep in mind that this this assignment here of the key pizza to the value yummy is in some ways different than this assignment of the local variable pizza hash to this hash that we just defined there. Oh, these questions are juicy. Keep them coming. Any more? Any more questions?
Should keys typically be strings, or should we use symbols? Uh, yeah, you get. That's a thing. I would. I, I guess the the right answer is you should probably use symbols. My answer is I just don't really care. Uh, for our purposes, especially in module one, it's not going to be significant. Uh, I'll give a very brief explanation on what the difference is. When we haven't looked, at least I, I don't think I have looked at it with you yet, the idea of object IDs, and again, this comes back to this idea of identity versus equality. Here I have string one and string two, two strings. The values are the same. They both contain the characters P, I, Z, Z, A. But I can actually ask these a method that is sometimes interesting to explore, and we haven't really looked at that is object ID. Oh, stir one, not still one. He says, hey, man, your object ID is 7016032519, whatever. I don't care. Uh, but what is interesting to see is that string two has a different object ID. So two values, two strings with the same value, they would be equivalent, but they would not be identical because they are actually different objects, different entities in memory, but we'll be storing them in different places. Whereas, if I have a sim one, uh, we'll see that equivalent symbols are also identical. So if you like having pithy rules of thumb to commit to memory, uh, equivalent strings are not necessarily identical, but equivalent symbols are identical, right? So uh, a symbol, once you create a symbol, any other times you refer to a symbol with those same letters, it'll actually be that same object. Some people would argue for this, re this reason that it's used symbols as keys uh, because you conceivably save a little memory because you don't end up allocating new strings all over the, but whatever, like no one, I, I don't know. I think strings are good too. The thing, is the thing that is nice about a symbol is that uh, it, it kind of conveys that intent that, I, you know, I'm, I'm, never, I'm never going to write an essay of long form text in a symbol, right? That's kind of not the point of the symbol. It's kind of point is to serve as these little shorthand identifiers. So serving as a key and a hatch is a good example of being used as a shorthand identifier of some sort. Uh, whereas with a string, like this could represent a short, identifier, e.g. a key in a hash, but it could also be used to represent long form <coughs> text, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, so I'd say if, if, if you're going to make an argument to use symbols as keys over hashes, that's probably the best argument to make, that when you use a symbol, when you read code and you see a symbol, your brain will kind of think like, okay, symbol, like kind of a label or a tag or an identifier or something. Uh, whereas when I see a string, I'm like, well, this is, could be like a short little one word string or it could be the contents of a whole book or something like that. Right? Uh, so I guess after talking about it more, I've come around. I would say use symbols, but don't be dogmatic about it. And if people try to hassle you, like you should always use symbols, just be like, leave me alone. <laughs> That easy one. Yeah, that's how I do. <laughs> All right. Um, it is 53. Uh, I'm going to call it in a minute if there's no more questions. Um, we're going to go to lunch. We're going to be back here at 1 o'clock for some more lovely remote learning. I seem to have gotten the network at Turing to perform better here. Uh, so we'll hope that that holds up for the afternoon and that we get good bandwidth, good latency and all this stuff. Um, and we'll kind of see how it goes. Uh, this afternoon we're going to be talking about uh, object-oriented programming uh, from both a high-level conceptual approach of like what does it mean? What are objects all about? What does programming even do? Uh, and also from a little bit of like the nitty-gritty of like, okay, how do we define classes? How do we instantiate them? How do classes model state, model behavior? Uh, and It'll hopefully be, I think, especially clarifying for some of the exercises, like the command query exercises or the mythical creature exercises that y'all have been working on. Uh, cool. I'm going to be back to Twitch. That's a good question. I hope so.
I guess I don't have to type and also talk on the thing. Uh, now, now that I have the now that I have the network performing better than it was this morning, I'm going to try to go back to Twitch because I find it to be a little bit better uh, in my opinion. But uh, we'll just have to kind of play it by ear and see how things are working. Cool. All right, let's uh, let's break for lunch and uh, we'll see y'all back here same time, same place. Well, different time, one o'clock. Stop that and I guess I'll just stop that.